We're here with Emil Deku. Thanks for sitting down with us. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So, um, so we want to talk a little bit about um, tomorrow night. And yes. you're going to be conducting The Wizard of Oz. Yep. Full film in its entirety on a screen in back of you while you conduct the NSO, who is performing the score live on stage at Wolf Trap. Um, how does this work as a conductor? Do you work from a normal score? Yes, I have the score that they recreated from the original soundtrack, which was lost in 1939. And it was put de back together. We pre premiered it here several years ago. It was the first time the score was played in its entirety by the same orchestra. Because years uh, ago, when the film was, was originally scored, it was filmed uh, first, and then they would make the, the underscoring of the songs. And then it would be recorded by several different type of orchestras, big orchestras, small orchestras. The cyclone sequence is a gigantic orchestra and several different conductors. Wow. And so putting it together here for the first time, it was the first time it was played from start to finish uh, by one ensemble and one conductor. And it's, uh, it's quite a challenge because uh, keeping in sync with all of the various aspects of the film, the songs and the dances and the dramatic action, the cyclone scene when uh, Dorothy's house spirals down and hits the ground, and kills the witch, and they're in Munchkinland, it has to line exactly to the one quarter of a second uh, to what the music is doing at that point. I mean, what was it like the first time you tried that process? Were, were there errors? Was it, was it a big trial and error process? It was terrifying. The thing is, you can't, make, you can't really make a mistake. I mean, not a huge mistake, because since the film is 109 minutes long, it's not going to stop for you or wait. Right. And so the, the singers are going to sing, dancers are going to dance exactly the way it was in the film. So you have to stay exactly on top of, of uh, the beat. To like a to a, a millisecond, literally, for it to really stay in, in synchronization. The first time we did it, it was extremely frightening, um, just because uh, no one had done this before ever, and so we were kind of like the, the guinea pigs for for seeing if this works. Since the premiere here at Wolf Trap, it has been played. I've conducted it with several other orchestras. It's been around the world. It's a huge hit now because people finally get to see this great iconic film. Uh, a part of American popular culture in a totally new way. Because the film is the same, the singing is the same, the original singers, and uh, the soundtrack, the, the uh, sound effects. The orchestra is playing something that no one has heard before, which is the full detail score. Because so much of it from 1939 technology doesn't come across, even in the best home stereo system or best movie theater, and even with the, the, the fine orchestration, the detail, the colors that the orchestrators put into the piece, are absolutely magical, but they're obscured by the wind in the cyclone, screaming witches and munchkins and flying monkeys. And so you can hear all that stuff, but you could finally, for the first time, see uh, the real genius behind this film. Do you ever find it hard to focus with the movie actually projected in the back of you? And well, the movie's almost above my head, which is a little, I, I can't really see it because I have to let it look straight up. And it gets, it makes you kind of dizzy. But I have a clock in front of me that runs uh, like a, an old-fashioned clock to show exactly where we are in on the page. Okay. And I have a television monitor that has the film running in front wow. of me. So I just have to look down, look at the clock, look at the score, look at the orchestra, and hopefully keep it all together. So each time you conduct um, live orchestra to film, you've done it numerous times mm -hmm. now. Do you make new realizations on how to improve upon the process for next time, or is it pretty standardized? From uh, no, I always I have to watch the film. I mean, I've watched Wizard of Oz before we first did it, probably 20 times through, yeah. uh, and several times a day, and it gets, it gets hard. But what you wind up doing, I found with uh, these films, we had a Rodgers and Hammerstein premiere last summer at Wolf Trap, and I have all these just mechanical stuff I'm looking at, clocks and digital this and that and numbers, but what it really boils down to is just memorizing the film yeah. and accompanying it as if the people were live. And so instead of like waiting for a clock, I can wait for someone to turn or wait for a visual cue that's always going to be the same because the film's always the same. Right. Or watch the dancers do something specific. And so I've tried to tune the technology stuff out and just uh, pretend that they're in front of me and yeah. that they're living people and that we're accompanying them live each time we do it. So these film concerts always seem to draw amazing crowds. The show's selling very well for tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what do you think the appeal is for the, uh, the general concert goer and the general symphony lover? Well, I mean, personally for me, I, this is my favorite type of concert because I love uh, symphony orchestra concerts that incorporate another element, a theatrical element or a multimedia element. And this film in particular, The Wizard of Oz, I know people who are coming tomorrow who saw it when it was first released and certainly people in the 50s, the baby boomer generation, when it was only available once a year on television before video. Uh, in the 1970s, late 70s, uh, it was released, and then now, of course, you can watch it anytime you want on DVD. And so you have this generation, grandparents, great-grandparents, parents, 
kids, teenagers, little kids, and it means something different to each group. Yep. Um, because the, the film, I, it, it's a children's film basically. Dis, uh, Disney had come out with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs a few years before, and MGM wanted to get the 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 kid audience basically, and so they had the young Judy Garland with this children's story of Frank Baum, but it was really brilliantly put together in a way that they had no idea, um, sort of like accidents of, of genius that came along. And what they wound up constructing was a, a piece, a very important piece of American popular culture of the 20th century, that everybody knows this story. Mm -hmm. But the thing that keeps it fresh is that as you get older, you see different things in this film. The film never changes, uh, but you do. And when you're a little kid, you can you can enjoy like we did the the, the flying monkeys and the witch and you know the sinister stuff right, right, is all right. kind of fun. Uh, but when you're very you know when you get older, if you're in your 70s or 80s and you're looking at this film, it's a it, it's a film of discovery of discovering yourself and as a film of the meaning of what home is. And as Americans, we always have a sense of r rootlessness in a way because uh, unless you're a Native American, no one is from this continent, and. And our sense of, of meaning of home is very different from, from people in Europe or in Asia, uh, where you will spend generations in one house. That's interesting. Right? And so it's sort of a discovery of, of uh, the meaning of, of, of where you belong, which is fulfilled at the end of the film when she really realizes her true meaning of home. Yeah, it definitely transcends generations and, and cultures. It does, yeah. it does. And you see, you know, kids are sometimes, I, I was surprised the first time we did this, uh, when uh, Margaret Hamilton appears, and it really, I forgot how frightening it is, because I, I don't think I've ever seen her on this big of a screen before. And there's a very big close-up of her face, and it's green and, and frightening. She has a big nose, and it's, she's cackling. And there's a little kid right behind me, screamed and started crying, saying, Daddy, Daddy, I want to leave, I want to leave. And I think he probably walked him out and came back, but it was, uh, it, it, you, you forget uh, those old films, also like Pinocchio, there was a real dark side uh, to make the, the, the sweet side uh, that much more fulfilling when you get to it and more satisfying. Real quick, last question. What, uh, what film concert would you most like to do next? I, you know what I'd love to do, and, and maybe one of your viewers has in, input or pull, I'd love to do Complete E.T., John Williams E.T. It was done once live for an anniversary year. John Williams conducted the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles. The materials are there, the film's there. Can you make it happen? We'll try. Okay. <laughs> 2010, live ET. Got it. It's okay. a deal. Thanks so much. Thanks, Emil.